right, well, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks uh, for everyone for showing up. Um, wow, this is a really big screen. It's probably the biggest screen I've ever seen. Uh, but anyway, let me just uh, step back a little bit and tell you how I really got into Apple Watch and tell you a little story behind, behind uh, this whole uh, project that I did. So let me ask you, uh, who, who here uh, travels on board? Anybody? So um, have you ever faced a situation like this where there was really no room but standing room and this is how you basically had to stand for however long it took from, to get from point A to point B, yeah? So yeah, the, I live in Union City. So I take part to San Francisco every day, and this was not uncommon for me. Um, and it was very annoying, by the way, because I like to sit down, I like to be productive, I like to do stuff on my computer and, and relax. So um, this is really how I like to board a train. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's actually a way to do that. There are tricks. Does anyone know how, how to get yourself on a train like that? Any ideas? Yeah? Yep, you go to the end of the line or you go back a couple of stops, right? Um, so that's actually something you could do, but it, uh, it take, just takes a little extra time. Maybe it takes another 10, 15, 20 minutes or so. But then I decided, well, you know what? If I had all the information of when the trains are actually arriving, not their schedules, but the real time information, I can just kind of I can again make a pretty educated guess on how far I need to go back to get that empty train and, and uh, be on my way. So basically, I rely on this sort of information that you can see um, on the stations, right? Uh, it has pretty accurate information. It shows you which stations are, I mean, which uh, trains are departing. But I don't know if you've observed how often you see this information. Most of the time, you see something like this or a safety warning, or some sort of uh, thing to watch out for your digital devices, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, I complained to Bart about that and said, like, hey, I, I, I actually sent him a note. I need better information over here. Can we at least cycle the more useful information in such a way that I can at least see that 50% of the time instead of 10%? But he said, no, we cannot do that. Because we have like uh, disabled people who need to see this in, in case I cannot hear the announcements. So anyway, um, then I decided, well, you know what? It looks like BART has an API for this uh, departure information. So um, that's when LiveBART uh, was born. So LiveBART is the iPhone app that I created to solve this problem. Uh, basically, this iPhone app shows you all the departure times for the nearest station that is, uh, that's closest to you. And uh, you don't really have to select anything else. You just open the app, and boom, the, uh, the information is right there. So if you were to open the app right now, you'd, you'd see Powell, and you'll see all the departure times in Powell. And now, when I board a train, it typically looks, uh, oh yeah, there's my advertising, my Facebook advertising. Um, when I board a train, it typically looks like this. Yeah, there are a few people there, but plenty of seating, and I've been doing this basically since January. So. Um, no problems there, and I get a lot of coding done, and uh, it's uh, super efficient. The only other thing that bugged me still was if I had to basically go, uh, you know, I run into the station, and you know, I always had to grab the phone out of my pockets, and sometimes it's a little tight, and sometimes other stuff falls out of my pocket with it, right? That's uh, like credit cards and, and other important stuff. Um, I thought, you know, it would be really great if I could just look at my watch and see what, uh, what the departure times are. Um, so that's basically where the Apple Watch app of LifeBart was, was born. So um, we launched that on April 24th. And if you remember that day, that was a day after the watch came out on April 23rd. Um, and actually, for this portion, I didn't all do it by myself. I actually um, I recruited a friend of mine, Jeremy. Can you stand up? <laughs> Jeremy. So he'll say a few words also later on, but uh, he basically helped me uh, kind of transform the watch, I mean, the iPhone app that I had into, a, into this watch app over, over here. Um, so it's been running great. We've got 
I think by last count, about 1,400 people or so are using the app, and it's still counting. So this is basically the context um, in which I want to talk about design for Apple Watch. Because um, we've, we've done it, where we've um, gone through the journey, and we also learned from actually uh, pushing a, a watch app, what are the kind of pitfalls that are involved in designing and developing an Apple Watch app. All right, so um, first, uh, whoops. First, I, I just like to answer the question, um, why does it matter? Why should we even talk about, about designing on Apple Watch? Is it even relevant in the future? So I contend that the answer to that is yes. If you look at where wearables are today, um, you can see a lot of products in the market that are there. Some of them have been there actually for a long time. And this is just an area that keeps on innovating. Headphones have been there for decades, right? And yes, they keep on improving, but those are really wearables. Um, here's a device that uh, I actually just found out. It's called this Tego Arc, and it's a, it's a wristband. But you can actually, uh, on your iPhone, select what kind of patterns you want to uh, show on your wristband, so it's e-ink, right? So it doesn't even need light or something. It's the same stuff that your Kindle is made of, right? E-ink, that's an interesting wearable. Um, you got Google Glass and, and all its other uh, competitors. Um, and that, that would be a very interesting technology to see where that's going. And then, um, of course, there's a whole uh, plethora of smart watches and Fitbits and all sorts of uh, uh, workout gear. Um, there's there's even clothing now that um, that that can measure your heart rate and and things like that. So, in my opinion, wearables are here to stay, and therefore it's really important to learn the pitfalls of like how designing for a watch app and and how it's really different from a phone app or a web app. Oh, and then finally also. Um, this is just some research that I did the other day, and uh, believe it or not, for a 1.0 iteration of, uh, of a device, the Apple Watch is actually doing really well in terms of customer satisfaction. So when the iPad came out in 2010, the, um, the satisfaction rate was about 91%. For the iPhone, it was a little better, 92%. And for the Apple Watch, it's 97%, and that had a sample size of 800 people. So that's, that's actually pretty good. Um, despite its shortcomings, um, people are buying them, and people are happy with, with the device. So also for this reason, it's really good to know how to design for the watch and what to be aware of. And that's what I'm going to be talk, talking about today. All right. So. Um, what I wanted to highlight is uh, while you design for Apple Watch, there are certainly certain things that are still the same. I mean, certain design principles will still hold true, whether you're designing for a phone or for a web app. So I'll, I'll walk through some of those a little bit. Um, but then there are also certainly things that are quite different because of the technology and the architecture of the Apple Watch. And I will also go through those. So first. Let's take a look at the uh, common design principles that, that uh, the Apple Watch shares with other, um, other hardware. So the first one is uh, uh, user-centered design. So the idea here is that um, when you're on a phone, um, or on a watch for that matter, or a web app, what you want to see on the very first screen when you log in or when you um, open up your app is information that is relevant to you, right? It's This is my stuff. I want to see information that pertains to me. I want to know what I need to do next. Um, so there are a couple of examples here. Um, let's see, oops. Yeah, so in our life part example, right now the closest station from this location is Powell. So that's, I just want to see stuff at Powell and that's it. But I don't care about the departure times in Fremont right now. Um, so that's user uh, 
user-centric uh, design. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, here's another one, an example. This is Evernote. Um, so Evernote is a popular app. They also have a watch app. And um, over here, it shows all the, the, the most recent notes that people have entered. OK, that's, that's good. And on the watch, it's the, the most recent um, thing that they did, the New York trip, and then also a way to add more content, right? So user-centered design, that is a theme that, is, that will always hold true. Um, by the way, if anyone has any questions in the meantime, I'm OK with answering them um, throughout this presentation. We don't have to wait until the end. Oh, yes. Framework for development? CSS? No, not at all. So for Apple Watch, um, we have just used Xcode, um, Objective-C. Now, you can also do it in Swift, uh, but there's no CSS at all. So basically, what you would do is you would design storyboards um, the, way, the same way that you would develop an iPhone app. Yeah, so we're not. I, I could imagine that in so, at some point in the future, maybe uh, a framework like PhoneGap or Titanium Accelerator might get into this space so that you could really just create one app, but we're not there yet. Cordova or PhoneGap? I, I don't think. Oh, it doesn't have a browser. It has no browser. The, the, the watch does not have a browser um, at all, so, so the answer is no right now. Um, but something that I will also share at the end of this um, presentation is um, what's coming out in the future. In fact, yesterday, Watch OS 2.0 was just launched, and so I'll, it, it is expanding its functionality a little bit. It's not quite there yet. It doesn't have a browser yet, but I'll at least touch upon those things. OK, well, that, that, that's an inter interesting point. I'd definitely like to actually uh, research more into that. Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, the other uh, principles that still hold true are hierarch hierarchical navigation. So here's an example for uh, Yelp on the phone and Yelp on the watch. So. Um, what, what this sort of navigation means is that you always go from the higher level and drilling down into, um, into more detailed levels, so master to detail to detail, right? So um, in this example, you'll see restaurants, bars, et cetera, high level categories. And then if you drill down on restaurants, then you'll see what's, what's here nearby you uh, and what, what is popular. And then you click on one of these, and then you'll see the detail. Oops, sorry. Uh, here we go. Um, and the same thing holds true for their watch app. It's, uh, it's high, highest level category detail, list of restaurants, and then the detail of the restaurant, right? Um, now, you'll see that the watch version makes a much better use of real estate, right? There's a lot less in there and only has the most relevant information, but the principle of hierarchical, hierarchical navigation still holds true. So, so that's still the same. Um, and then, uh, you know, displaying information above the fold, that's, that's even uh, more important for the watch. You know, that, that's a principle that's true for uh, web apps, iPhone apps, particularly so for, for the watch. You don't want to be scrolling through. Now, if you had a table like this one over here, using the, what they call the crown uh, control, you can actually scroll. You can scroll pages or, and, and content, but you don't really want to do that a whole lot, OK? Um, but it's, in fact, possible. All right, so uh, yes, you can also scroll by flicking. And that, that's also um, that's standard behavior for tables on the, on the watch app. Yeah. All right, so we've, got cover, we've covered some of the common uh, design principles that hold true. Uh, so now let's talk a bit about the, uh, the things that are different on the Apple Watch. And, um, and a lot of these concerns actually stem from the technology and architecture of how Apple Watch is built and how it really interacts with your phone. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a bit about the architecture of the watch because that actually puts a lot of limitations on how the watch, how you can really design for the watch. So um, first, let me, uh, sh let me share at a very high level what, what's happening um, behind the scenes, right? So the watch, the Apple Watch, as, as you have it, it won't, it really is, cannot do very much without a paired phone. Um, there are only a few apps, like the clock, for example, that continue to work, so that's good, it's a watch, right? So, <laughs> but everything else, it needs its, a com a com a com uh, it needs its uh, app on the phone that, uh, that it needs to exchange data with, right? So this is what it looks like. Um, every watch app has a paired iPhone app. Um, under the covers, the watch kit, as they call it, is considered an extension of the application. So um, I know this is a design um, crowd, but I'll go a little bit technical over here. Um, so what that means in the code is that we, we, uh, we control the behavior and we get all the data on the phone, and then we send it through the watch via Bluetooth. That's a Bluetooth connection that is there. Um, now, it's because of this architecture that we run into various sort of limitations on the Apple Watch and uh, pitfalls, right? So what the watch does do is it does the rendering. So it's got its own storyboards. Uh, it, it, it has images. Um, and it basically uses the watch kit to get data from the phone. And then also it processes gestures, taps, uh, things like that, and sends that information back to, to, the, to the phone. Right, so that it, it sort of acts like a dumb terminal or like a browser. Um, now, one thing, one myth that I want to dispel here is that the myth that the Apple Watch is underpowered. It actually has a pretty good processor. It has its processing power is about the same as an iPhone 4S, which is not too bad. Okay, um, but it is. It's not the power here that's a problem. It's the 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 need to have this Bluetooth connection and pass data back and forth that, uh, that is a bottleneck, okay? And I'll show you how that really affected our LifeBart app and what we did uh, to resolve that. So um, the other issue also is battery life. So knowing that the processor is actually not a, it's not an underpowered process processor, it's a, like the equivalent to a 4S, but um, Apple does a lot of tricks to, to keep its power consumption low. So uh, when I show like this, this app to somebody, it will blank out, it will time out probably in like 20 seconds or something, and then I have to keep on doing this you know, to people. Uh, that, that's just one, one of those things. Um, like other watches like the Pebble and um, even I think the, the Motorola one, they'll, they'll show the watch uh, face for a much longer time. And for in the Pebbles case, it's they'll just show it forever. Um, but yeah, with uh, with Watch OS 2.0, they actually have improved some of the performance concerns of of the uh, Apple Watch, and it should be better. I haven't tried it out yet; it just came out yesterday, so we'll we'll see if that's true. All right. So knowing that architecture, let's talk about the differences between designing for. Apple Watch versus iPhone or other other de devices. So, um, well, the very most obvious one, of course, is space, and that's a concern that we always have to worry about when we design for phone versus browser desktop, right? Um, but in in the case of the watch, oops, it's it's even more pronounced. You know, you got an iPad that's probably like a mini, and then there's a six plus, the iPhone six, and the real estate that you have on the watch is so much smaller. Um, and by the way, there are differences between the 38 millimeter and the 42 millimeter uh, version of, as well that could result in interesting bugs. And then we'll, we'll, we'll walk you through an, a use case uh, um, later on. So um, that, that by itself is an issue. So um, remember how I talked about 
having to pass data back and forth through, uh, through Bluetooth? Well, this is a problem that we faced while we were um, developing this app. So um, on this app, there's this button over here that basically allows the user to select a different station. So remember, it always shows you the closest one. But if you have, by the way, in the strategy of finding the best seat, you, you don't only want to look at this one. You want to see what this, the, when the trains are departing in Civic Center or 16th or 24th. Right? So you use this to select a different station. Now, there are actually about 50 BART stations out there in the Bay Area. And this table actually loads all of them. So you can actually scroll down and load all of them. But when we tried to load all that in, it took like, I don't know how, how long it took, uh, more than five seconds to just load that list. So that was a problem. Um, so what we did is we, we loaded the first four rows first and then did a dispatch to load the rest afterwards. Um, now, by the way, at this point, actually, I want to invite um, Jeremy, our developer for, uh, who worked on this uh, portion of the watch, to, uh, to kind of talk more about the details, how he solved it. Here you go. Does he? Yeah, just coming up. All right, so basically what, so when Christian said it was five seconds, this is more like a second or so, but when you were maybe a second and a half, right? But when you, when you, when, when we first tried it, we'd click on that button over there and then you, it would bring up that screen, but then you'd just see this thing saying waiting for like a second and a half. Um, and then that, you know, that seemed to make our, you know, everybody think that our, app was like very unresponsive, right? Took a, lot, took a while to get it in there. So that's why we decided that, that's, so, you know, we decided to reload the first four rows and then like, you know, you dispatch, you can set a time for dispatch. So we dispatch for maybe like, you know, a uh, tenth of a second or a fifth of a second, and then uh, told it to load the rest of the rows. And so in the meantime, even though, in the meantime, this, it would still be kind of unresponsive, but at the same time, you're immediately displaying those first four rows. Um, that's basically, you know, so the user immediately gets some kind of a response, hey, you know, I'm d it's doing something. So even though you couldn't scroll through, for, you know, you would basically be waiting the same amount of time to be able to scroll through the, the list. But, you know, to the user, it looks more like, you know, you know our, app, our app, the app's actually going, you know, I'm not waiting too long, you know, things like that, so. Cool. Yeah, this, this, oh, there's a question. Yeah, you would think, but uh, we, we just found in our experience that when we reduce the list down to four, it, it, it basically got rid of the latency. Um, there, there's still some overhead that need, we need to pay to get all that data through. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I can add more to that. I mean, yeah, that's just basically w what we experienced. I mean, I don't know if there's the overhead from the watch and the communication with the, with the phone. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, Bluetooth, you know, tape, maybe there's some overhead with the tables that are integrated with the watch, you know, because we could only use the tables that you know, Apple was had in there. Um, I haven't really experienced the Bluetooth connection cutting off, at least not not while using the app. Um, you know, maybe when you you know when you when you go when the watch goes to sleep for a little while or something like that, maybe it takes a little bit to kick in. You know, I've noticed sometimes, you know, I'll bring it up after it's been sleeping, and then you know. You know, apps take a little while to load back up information or whatever like that. So, yeah. Okay. Any more questions for Jeremy? All right, great. Th thanks, Jeremy. Okay. So that's the slow table load performance. Um, yeah, so we, we already covered this. Um, so now let's talk about the 38 millimeter versus the 42 millimeter um, screens and what kind of issues we found with that, which is really interesting. You think, you know, that's only like four millimeters difference, right? It should not be a big deal, but there's actually, there, there are actually some significant differences. Like number one, yes, the 42 millimeter is bigger. We can see a little bit more, like you see here, how Powell was 
uh, truncated and you'll see dot, dot, dot. There it could actually have the whole string over there. Um, you'll see a little bit of the fourth row down there. Here you only see three. But the most, the most significant bug or problem that we found over here was actually, again, with this button. Like, so when we initially created this area over here, it was just an image. Uh, I, I created it in like, uh, uh, um, Adobe Illustrator. And uh, it was an image that, that was just this thing. And guess what? We found that the, the button didn't really work very well. Um, it's, it was like this, like on the 38 millimeter, the button worked maybe one, one out of three times. And in the 42 millimeter one, the, the, the button worked maybe one out of 10 times. So that's not good, right? We, uh, we, we got this button has to work every single time. So we also talked to the Apple guy, the Apple engineer, and we brainstormed a little bit. And we came to the con conclusion that the image area is too small for, for these uh, two uh, watches, right? OK, so let's make it bigger. So we, we made it bigger. In fact, on the 38 millimeter one, what we did was we, uh, uh, we didn't change the, uh, the size of the visible part, but we added invisible pixels around it, right? So there's a larger area to, to tap. So that seemed to work um, for at least the 38 millimeter one. So we got, it seemed to work maybe eight out of, eight to nine, nine, nine out of 10 times, it seemed to work okay, all right, great. Now when we made that one bigger in the same way, it still wasn't as good. It maybe worked half of the time. So wow, what's that? So after a lot of trial and error, we came with a dimension that, that seemed to work. See? <laughs> it's, it's very interesting how even between the two different uh, watches, you, you kind of have to work around it. And we had to make this area even taller to, to make it work. So that's, that's something you might want to consider when you, uh, when you design for Apple Watch. Yes? Well, um, there are actually different assets. Now, you can, you can use, I, I see where you're getting at. The, the aspect ratios are, in fact, uh, different between the two. We try to keep the same aspect ratio, but um, it just wasn't optimal for the 42 millimeter watch. On top of my head, I, uh, let's see, that one is 100 by 60 pixels, and this one is uh, 80 by 48. This 80 by, eight, 80 by 48, 100 by 60. So th they're not exactly the same. Um, by the way, any iOS developers here that know whether you can uh, use vectors? Oh, Ivan, there's a. Uh, it will only take PNG, so even all those cool animations that Apple does when uh, they have like the activity monitor, all th all they're doing is really going back to like old school web stuff and like spinning a PNG and like changing all that. So it's pretty like low uh, dev. Yep. Yeah. As f as far as my experience in terms of developing on iOS, there isn't really much of vectors. It's all uh, PNG pixel based images that that you need to use. All right. OK, any uh, other questions on, on this interesting problem? So remember, when, when you develop an app or when you design for, for an app, this is a very interesting problem. You, you really need to have your team actually download it on two different watches and make sure it works on both, because it might not. Yeah. So um, the question here is, uh, about the number of rows. This one has three, this one has three, and a little bit more. Um, that's actually variable, right? Because in the storyboard, depending on the, how, how tall your rows are, you can probably have more stuff. You just, you know, I might not be able to show the number of cars, or, you know, I have to truncate the name, but you can certainly have more, more rows in the table. Um, optimally, when I look at the design for other apps, usually I see like three or four rows at the most. I don't see anything more than that. Because then it becomes a problem of like, what if you had to tap it, right? If you had to tap the row, 
if it becomes too narrow, then you get the problem that you might mis mis tap the row, right? You might tap the wrong one. Um, no, because in fact the the swatch version does not do anything when you tap the row. It, it the, uh, it's just read only. There's no functionality. Yeah, you had a question. Prototyping. Um, well, the only tools that I have used for for this app is really just Photoshop. Um, no, no real. I have not seen any tool yet that that would allow you to like envision or something to do something like that. Yeah, Morgan. I was going to say, I know Envision as a team is working on, on adding that to their, their line of upgrades. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Maybe in Envision then will, in the next iteration, will uh, support it. OK. Any other comments or questions? Yes. What hap So how do you handle names that are too long? Well. Um, in iOS, there's actually a way where you can specify the width of a text field, and it would automatically truncate it if, uh, you can specify what you want to do with it. Do you want to truncate it? Do you want to wrap, we want the text to wrap around? Um, or um, do you just want to leave it as is and just go off the screen? Um, so like in this case, for this uh, label for uh, the station, we chose to just truncate it with the dot, 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 and that's built in in iOS. Um, same thing if we had a station name that would run long, we would probably also do the same thing. I actually forgot what we did for that. Yeah, I think what we chose to do here is we could, we, we, we would wrap it around uh, for at most uh, two rows. Yeah, so that is, that is configurable. In, in, uh, in the WhatsApp. Any other questions here? OK. By the way, actually, I'm, I'm just curious. Who is now in process of designing a, an Apple Watch app? Yes, a few. And who, who, who is thinking of doing it in the future, in the near future? A couple of you? All right, great. Cool. All right, so let's uh, move on to the next uh, bit. Um, so I've, I've, there, those are some of the differences that that Jeremy and I ran into while developing the LifeBart app. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to highlight a couple of other differences um, that that are more common knowledge, but I'll just go through them anyway. Um, so um, when you develop an app and design an app for a iPhone or a web app. Um, well, of course, when you do responsive design, you're basically de de designing for different screen sizes. But on the iPhone, you really just have one app that you need to design for, or more or less, except if you might support um, larger and smaller iPhone screens. Um, but it's still basically one app. When you create an Apple Watch app, you're not really just designing for one distinct app, but you're designing for three distinct apps. You've got what you call the traditional app, you got a glance, and you got a notification. And they all have three different code bases, um, and there are different uh, interactions that you can do with them. Okay? So the watch app is what I've been showing you already, and kind of that kind of behaves like an iPhone app, just a lot smaller. So that, that's pretty straightforward. The Glance is a, an interesting kind of app. Um, the Glance is very limited in the sense that you only have this much of screen space to work with. You cannot have tables that go below, so there's no scrolling involved. Um, you, you cannot really tap and interact with it. If you tap this thing, it will basically go to the app. Um, but the good thing is the Glance is something that um, uh, Apple has a special menu in the Apple Watch. If you kind of like scroll up, then you'll see all the glances, and you have glances that show like your activity level, y the, the time, uh, the weather, uh, and you can really glance to them really quickly without having to load a lot of things. So it's a very lightweight app. Um, but uh, you know, you could actually code it separately. There's a separate storyboard, there's separate code for it. So that, that's what the glance is, okay? Does it, does it make sense so far? All right. 
And then you have a notification. Um, and notification, there are actually two forms of it. There's, there's a short form and a long form. Um, so like the iPhone app, um, any notification, by the way, that you push to the phone can also be pushed to the, uh, to the watch. Um, but uh, where it is different is that if you push a notification that, is that you kind of code specifically, you can have what they call a long form and a short form. And sorry, I actually don't have any uh, screenshots for that because uh, we didn't develop that yet. Um, but the short form notification is basically when you just get a notification saying, oh, you got an appointment coming in, um, you know, in the in next 10 minutes, and that's it. Um, that's a short form. And a long form would be you got a notification, but then you got buttons underneath it that uh, where you can do something, like you can accept or decline or perform some, a certain action. So that's a long form notification. Um, so for LiveBart, we actually didn't really get to do that. We only used the, uh, the built-in iPhone notification, so that's what this is. You know, Fremont train, departure in the city, station in four minutes. That's a notification that we use, but it's not a short form or long form notification. Um, oh, another thing to note also, since we're talking about design, um, Apple recommends to use dark backgrounds to preserve power because uh, it's just uh, less expensive to render, right? just like those old Nintendo games. Yep. Um, well, the the glance actually starts up a lot quicker, right? Um, and on the f on the f on the watch, you have like you can actually kind of tell what glances you want, and you can quickly flick through them. Um, now, it is lightweight, but you cannot do a whole lot. So, um, the use case really would be. If you if you can somehow reflect your the information that you want in a very quick view, and that's all you need, then you would have a glance. Now, as an app, you are not restricted to just have a glance or have an app. You can have all of them, right? You can um, in your bundle you can have notifications, glances, and and apps. It's just that you would access them differently. Uh, this one you would access through that big home menu with all those uh, icons, and you would click something, and then you'll you'll get to the app. Uh, the glance you would get to by going through the glances screen. Um, why Apple did that, I actually don't really know. Um, maybe they came up with a way to develop the glances first, and then the apps came later. Uh, at, uh, at this point, it's just speculation. Yeah. Um, by the way, Jeremy, you worked on the glance and the app. Do you have any, anything else to comment on that? So I, th I think your question was the difference between the glance and the notification. Is that right? Or was? Uh, yeah. Just like, what would be a good reason to make a glance? When would be a better reason to do a notification? Okay. So well, the glance is is you're basically looking for the specific information. So you know you want it on the screen. You want it. You want the information really fast so you can go right to your glance and look look at it. So, so like here. You know, you see Fremont Station, the next two departures are, you know, Rich Richmond, Daily City. Whereas the notification is actually more of a uh, push from your, your, watch, your phone. Your phone says, oh, there, you know, I wanted, you wanted to see, you know, when, you know, this train is going to arrive and I'm going, so I will notify you that in five minutes from now, you know, it's going to happen. You, you know, you, I mean, it's going to depart. So you're actually, it's not, it's not, uh, a case where you can just say, oh, I want to know what it is. So, so for notifications, you can't really just pull that from your, on, your, on your watch. It's actually pushed from your phone. Um, whereas the glance, you can actually just really quick say, oh, I, you know, it's leaving in three minutes or something like that. OK. Oh, thanks for the clarification. I, I think I misheard your question earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, even, even if you don't have a specific watch app for, for like, say, an app, it will still push notifications from those apps on your on your phone to your watch. So even if they don't have an Apple Watch developed for your that app, it will, you'll still see it on your you'll still still see it on your watch. The live bar notifications on the watch are those coming from the mobile app? That's just coming from the mobile app, yes. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Right now we as I mentioned there's what they call the short form and long form watch specific notification. We haven't developed those out yet, but those would be uh, different from from these that originate from the 
phone. All right. Um, there are no more questions. I'll continue. Oh, well, this is just a zoom in of it. All right. So um, force touch. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Now, when you have a watch app, one thing that you should note is there are no menus, right? Where are the menus? Like in a f on the iPhone, you could have like a hamburger. On the, in the browser, you'll have you know, all sorts of menus. But really, there's no space here for menus. So what Apple actually has done is they have a new gesture that is actually pretty novel. It's called the force touch. And what that means is that you could, you could tap a watch app, and that would basically be like a regular tap. But if you were to tap it harder, more forcefully, that's, that's called the force touch. And what it would do is, in the UI, you would, it, it will basically, the effect that you will see is it will push the screen back, and then boom, the, the menu will bounce back. It's, it's kind of neat to see that. Um, so we actually have not implemented it in our LiveBart app yet, but here's an example of an app that does it. And most of Apple's native apps, actually, um, the one that, that come with the watch, they, they have uh, a, a force touch menu. So this is a, the music player app. So you do a force touch, and then the menu comes out where you can do other sort of things. Right? So that, that's another thing that you can consider while uh, designing an Apple Watch. So there's no menus. I mean, no traditional menus, but you've got the, the menus that are um, driven by the force touch. Yep. The design for for the screen that comes up with the force touch, there's I think there's not that much flexibility. Essentially, what you can do is select the number of um, icons. So it's basically one, two, three, or four, and that's that's all you can do. And of course, if it's one, it will be in the middle. If it's two, it will be on the side. Three, you got one, two, and three in the middle here, and four is what this would look like. But there's at this point, there's nothing much else you can do with that. That could change in the future, though. Um, well, not having developed these quite yet. Oh, by the way, prior to yesterday, you couldn't even do this yet as a third-party application developer. Starting yesterday with the beta, you can. Uh, so I'm just guessing here. My guess is that you can probably have your own icons and that you can use over here, and the API will allow you to uh, do more custom things. Um, but I, I have yet to download yesterday's beta and, and see what it can do. All right, so that, those are basically some of the major differences between developing on the iPhone and um, Apple Watch and this, the kind of design concerns uh, that, um, that you will have when you do this. So um, let's talk about Watch OS 2.0, and this is brand new. Off the press, this just was released yesterday as a beta, um, and we haven't had the time to really integrate that, as I said, but I want to cover some of these things. So I think the most significant one is what they call third-party complications. <laughs> and if you don't know what's a complication, don't worry, I didn't know what it was either until I read this. But a complication is basically a little bit of information from a third-party app. Um, by the way, I'm talking about third-party complications because the watch already has Apple complications. right? So. Um, this is a third-party notification. You can see her uh, VW emblem. What this is is actually the app that tells a electric VW owner how um, how full their car is being charged. Okay, so that's a complication. This here is another complication. I think this one is for an app that controls the light in your house. Here's another complication. This complication basically shows you uh, departure time for a flight going from San Francisco to whatever ORD is. Um, it's flight 88 at 3.45 PM. So those are complications. There's little bits of information that you can grab from another um, app and actually embed it in the standard watch faces. Right. So um, up to yesterday, the only sort of complications that you could put here are like your activity app, um, the weather, 
um, and just the ones that come, come with the Apple Watch itself. So here's a few more examples, right? Um, this is a f this flight information. You got scores from uh, two, two sports teams, VW, and some home automation stuff, OK? So that, that's new in 2.0, and I think that's going to be very interesting to, to build that out. Let's see. So the other kind of things that are new with 2.0 are, are these things. So let me just explain what they are. Um, so the Taptic engine, um, the Taptic engine is a, a sensation that as if somebody is tapping on your wrist. So if you have a watch, and um, you can actually set it up instead of like ringing, it could do the tapping thing, and then you'll actually feel it like tap 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 on your wrist. It's very subtle, you know, very unintrusive. But now, as a third-party designer and developer, you can actually start to use that. The digital crown is this this little dial. So up to yesterday, you could only use it for scrolling through your table, basically. But now you actually have full control over what you want to do with it. You could maybe use it to zoom in or zoom out or other sort of things. The acceler accelero uh, accelerometer, um, it basically uh, records the speed in which you move your arm. So you can actually have certain apps that make use of that, like if you want to do a swinging um, you know, count, how fast you can swing a bat or something, you know, that, that sort of thing. Um, Heart rate sensor, uh, that's, that's now available. The speaker, the microphone. So um, with this new update, we can now start developing and designing apps that will make use of that. So let's see. That basically concludes what uh, I wanted to share for, for uh, designing for Apple Watch. I know it's not exactly responsive, but I hope that through this you can learn a bit more about the design concerns that you would experience if you were to develop an Apple Watch app. Um, also, um, Joe, Joe Consulting is a sponsor for this event. I'm the president of it. Uh, Kevin and uh, Jeremy are part of it as well. And um, you know, if you as a designer, you have a terrific idea of building an app, we'll be more than happy to help you. Come and talk to me. I've got my business cards right here. Also. If you are looking for a job, I might actually have something for you. We have clients that need, um, that need app development, uh, even web, uh, responsive web design, um, lots of things that are, um, that are in our pipeline, um, including business analysts, uh, testing, you name it. You know, we, we have all of that. And uh, that basically is it. Kevin? Oh, yeah, questions, questions and answers. We, I know we covered some already during the talk, but if you have any more now, um, let me know. Yeah. Um, my question is on what's your take on that. Okay. Um, I think it's useful. Like right now, if I if I open my mail app in the, on the watch, I see the subject heading. I see a few words of what's coming next. I'm like, oh, what, what's happening? I click on it and nothing happens. <laughs> I actually want to be able to see that, and the 2.0 will actually allow you to do more things with the uh, mail app. Then you can actually reply on on, on, the, on the on the watch itself. In my opinion, it would be useful because otherwise I would have to take out my phone again and and look at it. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Yes, back there. Yep, it actually does uh, speech recognition. Um, in fact, I could reply to text. I can, I can do various things with this thing, um, just using the uh, the speech to text uh, kind of uh, interface. Um, let me see if it works here. Like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to text Kevin. Hey, Kevin, this is a great meetup. And uh, I'm sending it. There. Yeah, it looks like it could work. <laughs> there you go. So it's actually pretty good in terms of its uh, speech to text recognition. So you could be driving, you could be doing something, and I've, it's actually happened to me. You can actually receive calls on this thing as well. Um, when the phone rings and you don't want to pick it up, 
you can actually speak to your to your watch like this. So you'll see like Star Trek and you know all kinds of uh, <coughs> um, uh, you, you you see basically you you'll see people doing this uh, more in the future. <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. I, I don't know whether it's the watch or the phone doing the speech to text conversion, but it's actually pretty quick. Yeah. I I believe it runs in the background because uh, the the final statistics it just keeps on going now because I can check now how long I've been standing or walking or sitting and that just keeps on going. You don't have to keep an app open for that. The I don't know about the accelerometer, how that works, per se, uh, um, but my guess is not. Ah, how much more work does it take? That's a great question. So how much more work does it take to build an Apple Watch app if you already have a iPhone app? Um, I think actually getting the iPhone app out is probably doing a lot of the work already, because remember, all the data that you need to get from the APIs is going through the iPhone app. Um, so in that sense, if you already have done the heavy lifting of getting the data, then it's a matter of creating the extension and getting it on the phone screen, which of course takes some work, but um, it's just a little bit more incremental. Um, you know, For us, it took us two months or so to do, but it took me uh, a lot longer to get the basic phone app um, out. Yeah, it doesn't work that way at this point. Um, right now, one watch can be paired to one phone only. It's a one-to-one -one connection. Yeah, so if you want to somehow communicate from one watch app to another watch app, as long as they, they both have their own paired phones, and there's a common app that they run, then then you could probably do that. You know, I, I mean, just that's just how messaging and other things work, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I no, I said I used uh, Objective C, but you can also use Swift. Um, both of them would work on uh, um, on creating an Apple, Apple Watch app. It's it's using the uh, the the bridge. You can actually pretty much intermingle Objective C code and Swift code within the same app. Not right now, at least not automatically. You just have to code it out in in, in the storyboard. But even without having the iPhone app. Oh yeah, so that is right. So you need at least some dummy iPhone app that just exists. It might not do anything, but at least it's there to to feed the data or, or something, yeah. So you cannot have a watch app without a native iPhone app. For now, um, my, my actually indications are that I think that in the future we will have native apps on, on the watch. I, I've been reading some things uh, yesterday on what's to come, and I think that's not too far away. For LiveWart? Oh, uh, sure. Um, so for for live part, we are adding. Uh, well, we are adding better notifications. That's one. We're adding a map like uh, Uber kind of thing where you can see moving trains just because it's cool. <laughs> um, let's see what else did we want to do. We probably want to have some planning functionality over there. Um, the live part app is really just for fun. That that uh, Jeremy and I are working on, just to show what we can do. Any other questions? I think this is, I should probably give the floor to whoever has any, is lo you know, who's looking for people to uh, recruit, right? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Christian. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so um, I'll do some lightning talks now. So.